So at this time, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Patrick McConnett. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce him. He is our, our head of school. He is the one that helps us live up to our core values every day and helps us keep a focus on the, the long game. Patrick. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Uh, and thank you all for taking a little time out of your busy day here to learn a little bit more about Flint Hill and our upper school program. Um, as Jennifer said, my name is Patrick McConnett, and I am our head of school here at Flint Hill. Uh, and I'm so happy and excited to be here with you all today. Um, in fact, for what it's worth, I was on the other side of all of this just a year ago. Um, my family uh, and I were prospective family here at Flint Hill. Um, and this is my first year here as our head of school. Previously, I was the head of school at a school called St. John's Episcopal School in Southern California. Um, and prior to that, I worked at a school that was pretty similar to Flint Hill called Phoenix Country Day School in Phoenix, Arizona. So um, I'm happy to share a few thoughts here today um, on why Flint Hill, why now, as well as what continues to guide us here in, in this community. So um, Jennifer, I'll, I'll ask you or Justin to, to move along on a couple of slides here um, while I share some of those thoughts. So go ahead and, and push it through to our, our first one. One of the things that drew me and my family to Flint Hill, Hill here um, is this really unique piece uh, that Flint Hill embodies within independent schools. Um, listen, it's the Northern Virginia, DC area. You know that there are a lot of really great independent schools out there, um, some of which have been doing really great things for a good long while. And while that is outstanding and, um, and they deserve all the kudos for that, one of the things that drew me and our family to Flint Hill is the recognition that this place has always had deeply built into its core a desire for growth and consistent improvement. Meaning as a relatively young independent school, 30 plus years since our reorganization in the early 90s, that this is a school that is not sitting back and saying, well, we've always done this this way, so therefore we're just gonna pat ourselves on the back. But rather taking an innovative and a growth mindset and applying it towards um, our classes, our student body, our culture, our values, you name it. Um, this is a school that's always going to be pushing that, that boundary um, and really trying to be attuned to the needs of students in a really complex and dynamic world. So we play that long game and you'll hear me talk a little bit more about that here coming forward. So go ahead and continue to advance on those slides, please. That idea of being always curious and always innovating for us, um, I think it's more than just words on a sign. It's more than just a, a part of our brochure or our website, but we really think about this. And so that impacts our student body, um, the, the courses that we teach, the ways in which we teach those courses, uh, and a really consistent recognition that in 2023, um, our kids uh, are, are learning differently than they ever have before. And there's an obligation to prepare them to be leaders in a really dynamic and, and sometimes challenging world around us. And so um, I'm going to focus here really briefly on how and why we do that at the upper school level. So go ahead and, and head on to the next slide, please. The piece that is always the cornerstone for us, while I talk about this innovative and growth mindset, the thing that will always stay at the center of who we are and what we do is right here in front of you. It's our core values. And at Flint Hill, one of the things that drew me here, and I've certainly seen it during my time here, is that these are not just uh, uh, banners outside, even though we've got some really cool banners outside my office that say these core values, but they're things that inform our really difficult conversations in uh, administrative meetings or in disciplinary cases or really exciting conversations in course generation and what are we thinking about to be in the course catalog next year or our physical plants and how we're making sure that our uh, campus surroundings are supporting these needs and, and these approaches as well too. So I'm going to speak about these five core values more specifically through the lens of the upper school because that's what we're talking about today, um, but certainly know that it permeates everything from our admissions process to our entire JK through 12 experience to ideally what you all will experience as alumni once you've graduated from this place and are making your own mark in the world. So let's go on to our, our core values. I have to share, I'm a former high school English teacher uh, and, and so words matter to me. And as you see these core values, one of the things that I think is really important to recognize is that they're not just singular nouns, 
but rather their action statements. And so I always focus on that, particularly here with our first uh, core value, which is respect and value all equally. We prize diversity of thought, experience, of family background, uh, and being an inclusive environment in which all of our students feel a sense of belonging. That's what we're always striving to do, um, while also recognizing one of the things that makes us special is that not all of our kids are equal per se, meaning they're not cookie cutters of one another. There's no two family structures that are like. There are no two student schedules that are alike. You know, there's there's uniqueness within all of that. And so as a former English teacher, the word that stands out to me here is uh, is, is the modifier equally in the it's an adverb. Uh, and, and so how we respect and value all of our students is equal in the sense that we give 110% behind every single student. So that could be the child who is excelling in a classroom and um, is saying, hey, I really want to think about this as an independent study or, or a way to extend my learning or the more practical implications of this beyond a classroom setting. It also impacts how we support our students through the learning center. If you have a diagnosed learning difference, how are we helping you learn how to learn uh, in partnership with your teachers and, and be a self-advocate? Uh, for, for those uh, unique needs that those students have too. So um, across a wide array of student experiences and learning styles, we're making sure that we're pushing you. It also impacts how uh, we look at our overall community culture as a whole. And so are there perspectives that need to be included in a discussion or how do we have an open dialogue, uh, sometimes around really challenging subjects in which we don't always agree, but that respect, that uh, healthy disagreement or that empathy of putting yourself in another person's shoes is really important because that's the world that our graduates are going to go off to in college and in life beyond. Um, and these are skills that they need to practice now in, in a rather contentious uh, world around them. And so um, we talk about it, we live it, and we make sure that it's impacting the ways in which we support our students every single day too. Let's move on to the next one. Somewhat similarly, but with a little bit of a different viewpoint, when we think about leading and supporting uh, with compassion, one of the things that I have truly loved about our upper school is that we give our students a lot of freedom. That could be uh, within their schedule and, and having a study hall or a free period, how you choose to use that, that time to um, get ahead on homework or meet with a teacher. Um, that's all about a part of that compassionate support, but it's also an opportunity for our students to demonstrate their own leadership. Um, it could be with uh, clubs, student social life, extracurricular activities, athletics. There is ample opportunity um, and an expectation, if not an obligation, for our students at times to take a step out and say, hey, I'm going to lead in this activity. Um, but there's also times where in which they need to seed that, that leadership brain and be able to say, hey, how can I learn from others that are around me? Um, it might be as a developing uh, freshman on our JV basketball team, as I was watching them play last night, um, and seeing how all of the students, including some of the, the varsity players, were there in the stands and, and cheering them on and coaching them on in some really key ways. And so how we develop those skills of leadership as well as followership, which is, is a necessary skill in life at times, is really important for us too. But doing it through that lens of compassion, recognizing that we're not always going to be perfect, um, is is a really important piece too because it's a, it's not a judgmental spot here it's a place to be able to try new things grow fail and, and build the grit to be able to get up again and do it more so let's move on to our next one act with integrity i spoke a little bit about the, the freedom that we give to our students here in the upper school and i think that that's a really key component as well as a part of a college prep experience because while you have your scheduled day here as a ninth to through 12th grader once you get on to college uh, uh all bets are off quite honestly. You might only have class for a couple of hours a day. And by the way, that teacher might not always call you if you're not coming to their class. And so we want to help our kids build the skills to navigate those responsibilities here now in, in a safe and supportive environment. And so when I think about freedom and responsibility here at our upper school and the need to act with integrity, um, that comes from little things like as I go out from my office here in a few minutes, seeing how kids pick up the trash after lunch uh, during their breaks here um, and, and take care of each other's and, and just being kind with a, a thank you or a yes sir or, or, or a no sir, um, to also then when sometimes uh, 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 things arise at an upper school setting where our students are able to um, 
honestly kind of culture correct for, for one another. And so one of the things that I've been really impressed with at our upper school is that we have a student uh, academic honor council and a student uh, disciplinary honor council in which when issues arise, a, a case of plagiarism or a, a potential disciplinary situation, there's opportunities in which our own student leadership group uh, uh, is able to adjudicate those matters. And so um, that means something because our kids are then culture barriers with the integrity of who we are as, as Huskies. Um, and honestly, it allows them to learn from one another in, in ways that are really developmentally supportive too. So acting with integrity doesn't mean being perfect, but it is expecting ample opportunity to learn from mistakes and how to be able to support one another. So that way, internally, within the freedoms that we provide, our kids are course correcting for one another, as opposed to having some type of teacher punitive environment in which it's constant discipline and, and detentions and all of that type of stuff. So we all have a, a responsibility with bearing that culture as well. Let's go on to uh, imagine what's possible. This is one of my favorite things uh, about the upper school in particular, because this is the launch pad to life after Flint Hill. Um, and so when we think about imagining what's possible uh, at the upper school, it comes in a variety of forms. The first is oftentimes a student's academic course load. What are the courses that I'm taking? How do those impact me and my own growth as a learner? Where are they challenging me or stretching me? Where are they an area in which I might be diving a little bit more deeply? Maybe I never wanted to take a, a, a visual arts class and here I am trying something new and discovering a real passion for it. And so this constant curiosity and innovative mindset that we're hoping to support in our students also allows them uh, ample opportunity to think outside of the box which I think is, is, is really important in this day and age too. So you have your course selection, which is a, a really opp opportune moment for that academic extension. Um, but then you also have a couple of other experiences too. Senior projects, each spring coming up, uh, our seniors will finish off their academic coursework and then go take it beyond campus through their senior projects, which essentially take place between uh, the culmination of our AP classes uh, and then graduation in, in uh, June. So it's a four or five week experience in which our kids sometimes are volunteering the community, working on an academic project, um, working in an internship or others. And, and so I was working with a senior the other day who said to me um, that she has an interest in broadcast journalism. And so I was taking a couple of moments to connect her with community resources, including current parents who have connections at Good Morning America or a local NBC affiliate. And so being able to build those things where you could take a personal or uh, professional curiosity and see what it's like in the real world before you go off to college and major in that and, and, and really choose that path. And so um, that opportunity to imagine what I could be or where I could make my impact um, is a built in part of this experience that really helps support our students as they cross that graduation stage and head to college and beyond. Last one, uh, a, a true uh, a Husky here in our community is always seeking to blaze the trail. We are Huskies very much by design. Uh, we have a lot of metaphors to pulling the sled and running the race and playing the long game um, and, and it's real. And so when you're 14 to 18 years old, you are oftentimes uh, uh, wired genetically, biologically to have a pack mentality. And here we are a part of a Husky team working together. And within that, we also recognize that there are going to be necessary points in time in which you need to stand out. You need to be able to say, um, yes, I am a part of a whole, but I am also an individual. And these are the areas in which I'm going to be an upstander and, and speak up for, for those that need that voice, or I'm gonna try something new, whether it's um, with an independent study class, one-on-one -on -one with a teacher, or in the design of a unique or innovative senior project, um, or starting a new club here at the upper school that perhaps we don't have already. And so when we think about being Huskies and blazing our trail, um, it, it creates this really unique environment in which other students see a student seeking to take that meaningful risk and stand out. And it says, wow, what could I do? And um, it's supportive, it's not competitive, um, but, it, but it really elevates the culture in some really impactful and, and powerful ways. So um, 
those are our big pieces. The, the core values of respect and value all equally, lead and support with compassion, act with integrity, imagine what's possible, and blaze the trail. And as I think about what your experiences might be in our upper school over the course of the coming years, those will always be true. And how you enact them is going to be incumbent upon your own engagement in this experience and this process. And so uh, I'm excited at what lies ahead. I am incredibly grateful for your family's interest here in Flint Hill and in our upper school. And I'm also proud to be able to share uh, uh, the perspective of one of my good friends and an incredible colleague, uh, Don Page, who's going to bring it down on a little bit more of a lower level here as we think about what this looks like in the upper school. So Don, take it away. Thanks a lot, Patrick. I, I really appreciate the time to, to talk about this. When I, when I know that we have a, a chance to talk to the larger community about what we do at the school, I always kind of look at the description and I wonder which, what we're talking about in this specific day, because we could talk for hours and hours. And I was really excited when I looked at the description. It said that this session is about our culture of support and inclusion and how we make students feel welcome and connected from the very first day. Um, I know that as you were thinking about the educational choices for your children, you want academic rigor and success, but in the end, study after study shows that we also want a safe place for our children, that they will spend the majority of their waking hours in this building even more than in their home, and we want them to know that they'll be safe, uh, that they can do the things Patrick mentioned, which is act with integrity and, and blaze the trail. And so I like to tell the students on the very first day, um, if you saw my job description, it might have 40 or 50 bullets, but really I have two jobs. Um, one is to make people feel that this is their home and they're safe here. Um, all the data shows that students learn better when they feel safe and known and understood. That's not just to make them feel safe, but to get the best academic outcomes for, for them, to make them feel like this is their community. Um, and the other is to find the best teachers in the world and to hold on to them and set them up for success. And when I look for those teachers, I think of the first one. I ask them how they interface with students. I want to see how they talk with students. When we say we work through a relationship style, we're being very authentic and honest about that. Um, it is very rare for me to be at a place where so many students choose to hang out in the teacher's rooms or the registrar's office or on the couch in the counselor's office. And that we want to have those relationships so they feel connected. And the other reason why is once they feel connected, they will share with us what are the things that they're experiencing so we can try and help ameliorate or alleviate some of those issues so that they can focus on what they want to focus on, which is their education, their classes, their athletics their arts, all the other things they're doing. Um, from the very first day they come on campus, we start with orientation that goes through a lot of what our cultural expectations are. Uh, um, we don't start classes until we have those things set up. And that's true based on a global level and on a specific level. I teach economics, for example, and yesterday was the first day of our semester. And we really spent the day really talking about norms more than, than other things, because we're going to get at some pretty, you know, politically uh, uh, ferocious arguments about what the role of government is in economics and what the role of business is in economics, but we can only do this the, if we treat each other the right way and if people feel comfortable sharing those thoughts. Um, I like to say every classroom is a place where you can feel like you can convince or you can be convinced and you can share that knowledge. And so we do that really, really purposely and intentionally. Um, and that being said, I feel really confident I could walk out to over 500 of my Huskies and I could look one and say, what do I always say? And the first thing it says, this is people's home. And I'd say, then what did you do? And it's like, this made people feel uncomfortable. And this is what we want out of this place. Um, you know, I, I think it's a good marker that my two children and uh, probably even love this place more than I do. Uh, um, and, and crave to be back at it. And, and in a short time, just like Patrick's children have come to find that. And so if you're looking for a place that wants to include people and make them feel safe, th this is certainly that place. Um, even last week, I had a teacher saw me wandering in the lunchroom and they said, you're doing that thing where you're looking for a student who's eating alone, aren't you? And I said, yep. And, and they've, they've already spotted me when I do that. And when I find them, I start thinking, what are their interests? How do I connect them with someone? Um, because we are a community and I, I look for that. 
Um, I'm proud that my teachers net recognize I knew that I do that, and I'm proud uh, um, that we're really mindful of those things. So, um, shifting over to the academic component a little bit, um, I'm going to introduce our assistant head of the upper school, uh, our academic dean uh, Debbie Ayers, who will talk a little bit about class and fit and and, and kind of include that theme. So, Debbie. Thank you, Don, and thank you, Patrick. It's a uh, it's wonderful to follow both of you. You um, have gotten me re-energized about talking about our courses today. Um, I know that as as you make your decisions about where to bring your students to school, in, in the forefront of your mind, along with having a safe place and an inclusive place, is also well, how are the classes? What are they going to be learning? Are they going to be well prepared? For the next step in their journey whether that is college or or um, internships whatever it may be are they going to be prepared if we choose this school and so i'm really excited to sort of touch on um, what our academic program is and how students are guided in the selection of courses and and maybe just a few of the requirements you know time is limited and you're eager to hear from some of our students and our parents but i do want to just give you a, a general overview. And so we have eight academic departments and our students uh, will experience all of them during their four years. Um, we have classes in English, obviously history, social sciences. Those are the first two, math and then science, two more. We have the classics where um, our students can pursue um, a progression of language um, in Latin or Greek. We also have Spanish and French in our modern languages. So that's uh, departments five and six. And then we have the fine arts department as well as an innovation department. The innovation department will cover robotics, computer science, independent studies, and a few other electives that uh, relate to technology, the internet. Uh, so it's a very vibrant array of courses. And we want to be very intentional with our students as they enter progressions. So we will guide their placement. We will um, put before them what the teachers are recommending based on their skills, their proficiencies, as well as their interest and passion to come up with a really balanced set of courses. The last thing we want to be is, is a school that really pressurizes their choices, that only the highest level or only the APs, we feel like there's so much worth in um, skills development. And those skills can be embedded in all of our courses to help prepare them for college. So we want them to be confident in, in their source selection when they're doing research. That's a skill we develop. We want them to feel very comfortable in presenting with a group or individually. So we embed a lot of projects in all of our courses from math to histories to English, obviously the innovation courses, learning how to work together. Uh, Patrick mentioned sometimes you have to be a leader. Sometimes you have to be a participant and accept leadership. So we want our students in their project based um, classes to to try on all of those roles, to learn how to delegate efficiently, to carry a task from its inception to its delivery, and then to be able to self-assess. How did I do? How did we do? What type of feedback is really um, going to be formative as we go into the next project? Where have we improved and what can we still work on? Those are things that we don't just leave to the students to ponder. We dig in, do assessment, do item analysis, looking at ways we can make ourselves better to be the best version of our academic selves. And, and that goes right alongside um, the academic integrity piece. I also sit as a factory faculty advisor for our academic honor council. And even though it can be that moment for a student that, that has some difficulty, I see it as such an opportunity to forge a relationship, to deepen a connection, and to be able to bring forward some character education as well, to help partner with students and families about decision making. Um, what do we feel about the impact of our actions as much as the intent 
of our actions. And having those really rich conversations, um, they stay with both me and I hope with students too. And so when I see them on graduation day walking across the stage, there's that knowing look that we share. It's like, yeah, we had that moment together and we're better for it. Um, it might have been difficult, but it was, it could have been potentially a game changer. And so I really um, welcome that as part of our curriculum here. Um, working with students as they get ready to um, select their courses in the spring is also part of the job that I have as the academic dean. So looking at um, a passion area and helping students delve deeper into that as they select the right courses to do so. Um, exploring a new topic, maybe one that they thought they could never do. Maybe it's that math class or, or going from the uh, one progression and picking up a statistics class. Maybe that's something they thought that they couldn't do and suddenly they realize they can and it's fun. I like having those conversations. Um, developing new skills. If um, there's an area that they have questions about, I can connect them to resources in the building. We have such a, a talented uh, staff of teachers, of faculty and advisors. And so helping point them to the resources that are right here on campus is, is a part of uh, the work that I do. And then helping students know what the progression is toward their diploma. Um, alerting them if they haven't taken a course that they need to take, making sure that um, their college counselor is, is a person that they can access, that they can um, find where their questions can be answered as they prepare themselves for that college selection process. So in a nutshell, that was a rather big nutshell, but that's a lot of what goes on in the um, offices of the upper school. And um, I'm just uh, excited that you're considering Flint Hill. And I'm so glad that you could share this time with us today. And I'm at this point going to turn it over to my uh, friend and colleague Howard Chang who's going to continue telling you about the upper school program and introduce you to some of our students and families so thank you so much glad you're here today thank you Debbie um, hope everyone can hear me my name is Howard Chang I'm the Dean of Students at the upper school um, I've been at the school for I think this is year 17 now which is almost as long as Debbie so I've definitely seen um, a lot of students, a lot of families, and a lot of the continuous evolution of, of our institution, which really never rests on its laurels and is always trying to grow and improve and innovate. So it's something I've lived and really learned to admire and value about the institution. Um, uh, my role today is to, to lead a panel of um, different members of our community. So I want to start um, by welcoming uh, the parent panelists that I believe are on the call and I'll, I will call their name and, and parent panelists, when you hear me call your name, um, if you could unmute for a moment and just introduce yourself briefly. And, and as part of your introduction, if you could sort of say, you know, and my child is so-and-so and they're in such and such grade and maybe a line just about your child so that we have a sense of um, just a little bit of a taste of the perspective that you're bringing in as a parent of a current student. That would be really appreciated. And then we'll, then we'll go from there, but I'll start with the parents first. and. Uh, the first I have listed is um, Mrs. Mary Gillespie. Hi, um, thanks, Mr. Chang. Um, uh, we've been a part of the community for seven years. Um, my twin daughters started in seventh grade. They graduated uh, just this past June, and I'm happy to say they were very successful in their first semester in their respective colleges. Um, and then I have a freshman son who started in seventh grade. He's now in ninth and he is involved in everything from sports to the, uh, we have a great Latin community. He's also um, a member of the uh, learning center uh, community. So we, we, I come at it from a lot of different angles, but i um, happy to answer questions at another time um, if you'd like as well. Thank you so much. And next um, on our panel, I also have uh, Leonora Butler, Bolter, excuse me, I apologize, Leonora Bolter. Ms. Bolter. Hi, Hi, I'm here. Um, nice to meet everybody. And thank you so much for the introduction, Mr. Chang. I'm Leonora and my daughter is Samara and she joined Flint Hill um, in grade seven. And um, it was a game changer for us. She came from a um, national cathedral 
and um, with very low self-esteem and Flintil has basically built her up to a mega machine of wanting to be the best and highly ambitious and everything she was not. So we are forever grateful for where she's at and what Flintil has brought out in her. Um, I'm here for any questions if anybody wants to ask. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I believe um, the last, but certainly not the least, of our parent um, panelists today is Ms. Tamara Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chang. Welcome, new parents. Uh, my name is Tamara Jones. Uh, my sons have been at the school, I would say, over 15 years. I have two that have graduated and gone on to attend four year institutions and my current son and last Everett is a 10th grader who happens to be a, an athlete uh, he plays basketball so if you have any questions I'm here thank you so much and um, I believe I saw the face of an alum uh, Mackenzie Fitzgerald is, is she on the call hi Mr. Chang hey there you are um, yes, I currently go to Ohio State University. My dad, Justin Fitzgerald, who works in the admissions department, asked me to be on this call. Um, I attended Flint Hill for seven years since sixth grade, and it was an amazing experience and prepared me so much for college and all my classes, and I'm extremely thankful. And just to be clear, most of our panelists today are not related to Justin Fitzgerald, okay? So that's just one. Okay? Everyone else is fairly objective and, and not related by blood to the admissions office. Um, and Mr. Fitzgerald, do you know if our current students have been able to join the call? Um, Adrian or McKenzie? Um, uh, Mr. Chang, I believe in the, in the list of people that... Um, I thought thought I saw Stephen Kennedy on and I see Adrian and on too. Adrian and Mackenzie Swain as well. So they they're all listed as being on the on the call. So hopefully they'll they'll acknowledge your your uh, calling upon them. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll call on them one on one again. Just to also students, if you could introduce yourself, just give a brief profile of sort of um, when you joined the school, what grade you're in a couple of the things that are part of your sort of world at Flint Hill. I think that'd be appreciated by all of our audience. So we'll start with uh, Mackenzie Swain. She's listed first. Mackenzie. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Mackenzie Swain. As you know, I'm a junior. I I first began uh, at Flint Hill in seventh grade and I play sports. I play lacrosse. I'm also a part of the BSU. So I'm in leadership for the Black Student Union um, and I'm really big in student life. So if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you, Mackenzie. And for our audience, she's using one of those um, virtual backgrounds. We don't overlook a futuristic cityscape. Um, it's beautiful out here, but it's not quite science fiction cutting edge. So just to be transparent. Um, and then uh, Adrian, Adrian, if you're there, if you could come onto the call, please. Hi, I'm Adrian Kladakis. I am also a junior and I joined in freshman year. And I'm a member of the soccer, basketball and tennis teams. And I'm also in the orchestra. So. I'm here if you guys have any questions. Thank you, Adrian. I appreciate that. And finally, um, Stephen Kennedy, if you're on the call. I will note that Stephen comes from a long line of Kennedys who have come to our school. He's a high achieving student who um, has also been a member of our basketball team and involved in our club life, the uh, Honor Flight Club, which sort of seeks to um, recognize uh, World War II veterans on specific days, particularly around, for example, Memorial Day when they fly into D.C. and give them special recognition when they arrive in the um, in the nation's capital at the airport. So those are some things about Stephen I can share. He's a great kid, too, and hopefully he'll be on the call or learn to mute himself as needed. OK, so we will move forward and we will open up the floor for anyone who has questions. And we know, of course, people can maybe feel a little reticent initially. So there is the chat box if you'd like to type something there um, or you can also um, come off of mute and just speak your question. And then we will try to take that and we'll do our best job that we can. With, my, with me and my colleagues to uh, both answer live and also answer in the chat if we if we did have some simultaneous conversation going. So if anyone would like to start off with a question. Aha. <clears throat> How many students are in each grade 
in the upper school. Okay, um, I'll take a, an initial stab at that. And then uh, if anyone wants to nuance that, they're welcome to do that. Our classes vary in size. And currently they vary in size from the um, upper 130s to uh, just around upper 140s, about 150. So when you add that all up, you're looking at uh, an upper school student body, just the upper school student body of um, well over 500, getting close to 600. It just depends year to year um, what happens in terms of enrollment and things like that. It's a transient area. People move and then you have sometimes a little um, flourishes, et cetera. But that's that's where we are. I think generally we, we like to see those class sizes um, in the 130s or so. It allows different things, for example, like the advisory groups to be set at 11 or 12. And that's a small enough group that people can get to know each other fairly early in the year. And of course, our class sizes are limited at 18. Um, so that's another sort of number that's relevant to bring up here. If anyone likes to add to that, they're welcome to. Probably you're wondering, like, how did you get so many sentences out of a number question? I could have just said a number, but OK, I'm a talker. So that's probably why they put me on as a, as host of this panel. OK, uh, similar to public schools, do you have honor classes or honors classes for upper school? And Ms. Ayers, would you like to address that? I mean, I know the answer, but I, I would like to give you a chance to, to speak as academic dean. And then maybe one of the students can also comment on their experiences within honors versus regular classes following you. So Ms. Ayers, would you like to go? Sure. I, I don't want to take away time from others, but the short answer is yes, indeed. We have honors classes. We also have AP classes. I will put a, a major plug in for our regular classes. All of our coursework in the upper school is college preparatory work. So I would love to turn that over to the students who take sort of an assortment of level courses so they can um, give their perspective on that question. Any students, Mackenzie, Adrian? And then after that, maybe even um, uh, Mackenzie, older Mackenzie can go next <laughs> so after that. Um, so I take uh, AP US history uh, this year, and then I also take regular classes. Um, and for AP US history, I know the workload is kind of a lot, but at the same time, it's not as bad as any other honors class or any other AP class, so it's not too much. Um, and the difference between honors classes and regular classes is really just the pace at which you're learning things and at which assignments are being put out and, and, and such. Um, so yes, there are honors classes and AP classes and they vary in difficulty, but not to the point where you're overly stressed or there's nothing to do at all, so. Thank you. And Adrian, if you want to add something, you're welcome to, or older Mackenzie can add something from her alum perspective now that she's immersed in college. Uh, yeah, so I also take uh, AP and honors classes. Um, so you can take honors classes all the way starting in freshman year. And there are a couple of APs you can take in freshman or sophomore year, but usually people start with APs in junior year. And you tend to like work your way up to more as you go later into your uh, high school years. Uh, so this year I'm taking three, next year I'll take four, and I did take one last year. So that's how you usually do it, but they're available to everyone depending on what level you're at. Thank you. And then our alum, any, any reflections backwards on your experience preparing for college, having taken, surely you took some regular classes in addition to honors, so like about that. Um, yes, I took regular classes my freshman, sophomore, and some my junior year. I think that what I liked about all the classes, especially in the AP, is the AP courses helped me learn how to have a relationship with my teachers. Flint Hill teachers are all really, really good about giving help and giving advice if you're struggling with something, and especially at the AP level with courses that are mirroring things that I'm doing in college, like the same pace of learning, the same pace of assignments. It really helped me to understand how to communicate with my teacher if I was having trouble with something or to help out other students at the same level. Thank you. Well, we have a lot of big topics that got raised. So I'll just go with the first one, which is about the Learning Center. Um, students at, or, and, and McKenzie alum, did any of you access the Learning Center? I don't know if, if individually any of you are receiving services. No, okay. 
Ms. Ayers, do you want to say just a couple of words about the Learning Center at the macro level? And then we'll, we'll drill down if, if it's necessary and we'll go on to the next topic after that. I'm going to work in the chat box for a moment. Sure, I was just working the chat box and getting ready to answer that question too. So our Learning Center is staffed by five full-time learning specialists and they coach students who have uh, specific diagnosed uh, learning differences. But as, in addition to that, the, they are here to support all faculty who are working with students to, um, to, to sort of bat around ideas about the best universally designed courses or course delivery systems and lesson plans. So we receive um, kind of more holistic support from our learning center staff that way, but they are there to provide some direct support to students who need it on uh, a weekly basis. We also have some students whose accommodations are monitored by our learning center staff. So it could be um, an assortment of accommodations and the learning center will, will help manage those. But um, yes, it is definitely uh, an asset and a, a, that we, we find to be very helpful, not just for our students who, who use the services regularly, but the um, collegiality we have back and forth on um, good design for all of our students. Um, the, there's a question about advisor selection. So I'll, I'll speak to that briefly, which is just to say that um, in the ninth grade, students are placed, um, matched up to a team of ninth grade advisors that we try to sort of train up and prep to be specifically sensitive to ninth grade transition to high school issues. Um, and then at the end of that year, <clears throat> they receive information in an introduction to the uh, group of advisors who are cycling back down to 10th grade on the following school year. And so they are allowed to rate their preference and add some other biographical information in a form that is then a major driver, data driver in the process by which they are placed into a 10th grade advisor. And so they are, try and we try to place people with, um, as high of a and strong of a preference as we can for the adult advisor. What we don't do is we don't make special effort to place friend A with friend B because we know they're friends and the two of them joined up and rated all their advisor preferences the same. Like we, we are actually looking to make new social connections and new, um, and new configurations of students in the 10th grade advisory. So that's, that's frankly, I think that when you talk about the long game, that is one of the strengths of our advisory program because people find over time that they're looking back that they are glad that they had that group that wasn't necessarily comprised of all their teammates on the same team and all the people they grew up with in the neighborhood. But there was value in being in that group with different people. Um, at the same time, on the short front, on the short term, that's the one area where students chafe in their 10th grade year because they're like, ah, oh, I didn't get placed with these three, three best friends that I wanted to go to. And frankly, that's, that's by design. So we do our best to try to really put people in situations where they can grow in their experience. Um, and then there was another topic uh, I answered about school clubs uh, broadly. We have a, a whole bunch of clubs at the school. We have a very simple process by which students can uh, register to create a club. And um, right now, I think we have over 70 again. And so we do put a cap at the end of the first semester. So we have just closed the lid on what clubs we will originate for this year. But we have any number of clubs that um, uh, go year to year because they're very institutionally entrenched. And then we have some clubs that really reflect a specific student's passion. And those clubs might they might be handed down and passed on to another student. And then sometimes they may just sort of fade away. But because now there's a lot of documentation around clubs and what clubs do, students are able to see clubs from past years. And sometimes, for example, this year, we had a student revive the origami club. And we haven't had the origami club, which is a very specific niche interest. We haven't had that for four or five years, but they saw it noted, noted in a previous year and they were able to revive that. So, so that's the short answer on clubs. Um, do any of the students or alums or parents want to comment on any of those topics before I start looking back at the chat? Because I want to give time. Those are big topics for expansion here, particularly from your valuable perspectives. A, the Learning Center, particularly if you had a child who used the Learning Center. Uh, B, the, the advisory process or the advisor program, the advisory program. Or three, 
um, clubs and club life. If there's anything in those topics that a parent or a student or even you, Mackenzie Fitzgerald, would like to comment on, we would welcome that now. Um, I'm happy to talk about the clubs and learning center briefly. Um, so my my daughter, um, one of my daughters graduated last year, was very involved in the clubs and the SCA, um, the student government. And um, that was a wonderful experience for her. She did athletics too, but that wasn't um, a strong suit. So she really found her um, sea legs and leadership um, in those in those areas. All three of my kids um, were in the Learning Center, and um, two out of three of them were in the Advanced Academic Program at Fairfax County. So I, I say that because um, I want to dispel a possible myth that um, the Learning Center is only um, children who have had learning differences that have translated into some challenges uh, academically. Uh, the, the Learning Center is an amazing tool. Um, my um, sister and her husband both teach at collegiate school in Richmond, and they tell me the Learning Center at Flint Hill literally is respected nationwide as, um, you know, just best practices. And um, the individuals, both in the middle and the upper school learning center, are amazing. Um, and um, I'm always happy to answer questions on that. And there's other things like the ambassador program that my son is involved in, where he, I think he has two shadow um, students today. So there are just a million ways um, for the students to get involved. Thank you for that so much. That's a great answer. Um, I'm gonna go to the chat. There's a question here, and I promise this, this parent or prospective parent is not related to Justin Fitzgerald, but this is a great question. Um, she mentions that when her son toured the school, he loved the classroom engagement. And she asks, how do all the teachers keep this classroom environment so engaged? And does the school have frequent training? Because he said all the teachers are great. So I'll address the training later, but I'd love to give our students, our current students, a chance to talk about their teachers because you know, you have someone who from the outside is saying, wow, like this, this looks good. This is, this, this is engaging and you're not feeling disengaged and bored and stuff. And, and of course you're there every day, right? So maybe not every day is fireworks and popcorn and stuff. So I want to have you all, Adrian, McKenzie, younger McKenzie, Stephen, if you, you're back on the call, I want to have all of you address what you're experiencing now in these current years that you're here, please. Um. So I know like one of the things that I love about Flint Hill so much, well, me as a social person, I love to talk to people and I love to talk to like people with different opinions and views. Um, and I think Flint Hill does a great job of being a median for that and having a space where I'm allowed to do that and a safe space at that where no one is feeling like their voices are being heard or they're being silenced because of an opinion that they have. And I think one of the reasons why our class are so engaging is just because the students and the people who are in the class, really enjoy the class, and they really want to make the class as best, want to make the class, wait, you, you know what I mean? Um, but uh, <laughs> I just think that, uh, <laughs> I think that no, it's a great you. environment. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's a great environment, and um, it's uh, it just allows for everyone to really nourish themselves. So, yeah. Thank you. Now, that's great. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And Adrian, would you care to speak about some of your experiences and Hopefully you've also felt engaged, you know, more often than not, and then talk about why, why you think that is here. Yeah, the, uh, one of the big differences between Flint Hill and other schools that I visited before I came here was uh, the class sizes. And that makes a big difference with the teachers because they you can focus on you more, you learn a lot from them in conversations. And also there's more like small group things you work on. And I find it easier to learn things when I'm working with the group on it. Uh, like just today in chemistry, we like built or not chemistry, but we're learning about chemistry in biology. Anyway, um, it's we made like models of these cells with like hands on things that we could build. And we did it in groups and it's fun. Same thing with history class. We're looking at a lot of pictures. It's not just sitting there listening to lectures like I've seen in other schools. Um, uh, just yesterday in English class, we had a discussion about books that we're reading. So it's a lot more engaging than I found at other places. And the teachers really do want to help you learn. And Mackenzie Fitzgerald, we do want to hear from the alum perspective, especially now you're in something completely different. 
right? Completely I actually, um, I want to speak from a different perspective. I have a little brother at school. He's a sophomore and I went away for college and I don't see him for months on end. And suddenly I came home and he had transferred in sophomore year. This is his first full year at Flint Hill. And he has straight A's and a B. And he told me that at his previous school, he went to a public school, that the difference between this school he's at now and the previous school is that the teachers don't give him busy work. They're actually engaged in the conversation. They go to him if they notice that there's something wrong and that he needs a helping hand. And watching my brother, who hated math for the most, most of his life, suddenly have an A is really it makes me really happy because I know how engaging Flint Hill is and it's just reflective in his progress from being a student that hated courses like math to now being an A plus student. That's a really good perspective. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, you know, part of that question was, are there frequent trainings? And, and I would say, say Flint Hill is, is intentional with the trainings that it does do. Obviously you could always have more training and more professional development time, but you know, the calendar is what it is, but Flint Hill has a very healthy budget and, and they're supportive of teachers engaging in professional development. And it happens both on an individual basis where teachers will apply uh, to attend a workshop or a seminar. It also happens on a broader scale where the school will, will bring experts in to train a group of teachers or the whole faculty during our professional development days um, or post planning or pre planning. And then it also happens very organically in a peer-to-peer -peer level. And this is, I think, the real strength of this is that there, there have been days in which we have time as a faculty and staff to do some um, in-house work, staff devel development, et cetera. And one of the initiatives, certainly in recent years, that I think has been one of the stronger hallmarks of that time usage is something called PDBFF. It's not something I originated. I was just pleased to observe it. But... Basically, you know, the people within our instructional coaching team and some of their, their colleagues will organize an opportunity for teachers to basically showcase things that they're doing in class that they think are cool and helpful and showcase them for other teachers. And what happens is that time gets broken up into sessions and you as a participant get to go to whichever session strikes your interest. And you get to see your colleague who teaches the same kids you teach, right, maybe from a different discipline, sharing things that worked in his or her classroom. And then, of course, because it's so informal and it's colleague to colleague, you're comfortable, you're able to ask questions, you're able to follow up later. Hey, can you show me more? Have those kinds of in-depth follow ups that maybe aren't as possible sometimes in those other formal settings or travel conferences. So we have a very, very healthy um, uh, culture around professional development. And I think that does contribute, as I said in my opening uh blather that you know being here 17 years this place has just changed so much and one of the ways it is most changed in my opinion is the constant evolution in pedagogical techniques always staying up to date and aware up to date and aware and it doesn't mean you you throw out the the bath and the baby whatever the kitchen sink I, I forget the idiom you don't throw all that stuff out necessarily overnight but it means that you're constantly aware of developments and you reflect on those and you incorporate those where appropriate, where they can enhance your practice. So um, that's what I see as, as one of the, the factors in, in why um, Ms. Mitchell's son had a good experience. And that's why I think this is a great place to, to work too. Um, where are we on the chat? Colleagues, are we caught up? Have we been able to address most things that have come through the chat? Uh, are we behind? Because I don't want to leave one person <laughs> walking out feeling like my question didn't matter. I certainly don't want that. No, Howard, you've done a fantastic job of keeping up with the chat and answering questions um, along with others. So I think we're, we're you know, current um, and okay. ready to Good. take on a question. Good. OK, so our table is clear. Any other topics, questions, follow up questions that people would like to ask? I think our parents are ready. Our, our, our students are ready. Even our old alum is ready. We're all ready here. Other questions. see what I missed. <laughs> Stuff about APs, GPA, yeah, yeah. Harkness Smith. Well, what, uh, Mr. Chang, one of the questions early in the chat, and we've covered this a little bit already, but um, standard question of what differentiates Flint Hill wow. from um, other schools, our peer schools, and I, I'm sure our students and parents could speak to um, their decision making in terms of choosing Flint Hill and the environment that they've experienced here. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I'll give a really short 
three word answer just to start us off because and I've never given this answer before when asked this question. But when I think about it, this comes to my mind. I'm going to say um, humility, uh, energy and flexibility. So those may be very pregnant with lots of implications and meanings, particularly in that combination. I think that combination has been very powerful for us, um, that institutionally we are humble, energetic and flexible. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave that. And then I'm going to allow others to to answer. So um, maybe our students first, because our students had to go through maybe most recently or most, you know, directly in your own experience, the choice of like, do I want Flint Hill or do I want something else, including a, a very strong public school system? You know, you had to make that decision. So so what drew what drove you? What made Flint Hill different enough that you felt like this was worth, you know, coming here in seventh grade or coming here in ninth grade or whatever grade it is that you joined? Adrian or Mackenzie, maybe one of you first. Uh, sure. I came to Flint Hill in seventh grade. And before this, I went to the Langley School and I was there for eight years. I was there since kindergarten um, or like pre-K, actually. Um, and honestly, I'm not going to lie. I was crying every day when my mom told me that I was going to be going to Flint Hill. I was so sad. I had so many lifelong friends that I'm still friends with till this day. And I was just I was so sad because honestly, Going into seventh grade, I thought like socially it wasn't because the academics will always be there. Um, but socially, I thought I wasn't going to fit in as well as I did at my other school. Um, and I was wrong. I was completely wrong. I came into Flint Hill and everyone was so welcoming and everyone, everyone came up to me. I didn't even have to like I went for my shadow day and everyone came up to me like, oh, what's your name? Let me help you find your buddy. Like everything. Everything was just, everyone was so nice and so welcoming. I think that's what really sets apart Flint Hill from other private schools. It's just a sense of community um, because I, I just feel like academic wise, the academics will always be there. So I think socially is what really sets apart Flint Hill from other schools and the sense of community. Thank you. Adrian, do you want to talk a little bit about what you see as making Flint Hill different for you from what you, other things you could have done perhaps? Yeah, I agree about the community. It's a big part of why I came here. Like I shadowed two other schools, which are both good schools, other private schools. But um, like I was I came here, went to a few classes and like this was the only one that I I had fun in every class. You know, I didn't know one person. Uh, my sister was here, but I didn't even see her that day. Didn't know anyone. And it was it was fun. Like people talked to me, uh, talked to me about different sports that I played. Um, and I remember there's, there's good lunch here. It's like buffet lunches. So got a good lunch. And then my shadow sat down at this table and they just all started talking to me, asking if I played like these video games they were playing and they just told me to join them. And so it was really nice that these people a year older that, I mean, I was in eighth grade, I was scared of all of them, but they were really nice and they invited me to be with them. And I was like, this, that's where I wanted to go. Thank you so much. And, and parents, you know, you all had to make, you know, a very, very big decision, right? Where do I invest my education dollars? Where do I send my child to school? What was a driver for you that made you decide this is the place versus maybe a different place that I could also choose to spend my dollars at? Uh, <clears throat> hi, it's Tamara. Uh, my sons all started out in public school in Maryland and we transitioned for my older two in the seventh grade and my youngest in the sixth grade and uh, with our older son I he like we were accepted into three other schools in addition to Flint Hill and what really made the final decision for us was the integration of technology with um, learning the small classroom sizes and um, the individual, I don't want to say individualized, but how the teachers try to, uh, well, they wrap around with the students. That was a big selling point for us. My other two um, were interested because they saw what their, bro their older brother was um, getting from the school. And um, that solidified it for us. But speaking as a parent with two kids that have, gone on to four-year institutions. Both of my older kids, um, my oldest one graduated in four years. My second son is on target to graduate in May 2023, which is also four years. I think the school prepared them 
to handle their schoolwork and play sports to manage their time. They were well prepared for school. They were able to communicate with their teachers during class and after class if they had any questions or concerns, which I think speaks volumes. And that's one thing I love about Flynn Hill was that they encouraged the students to speak up. And that will carry on through life. And my oldest son right now is in grad school. And again, he always references his experience at Flint Hill, the friends that he made that pushed him to do more. And the same can be said for my middle son. He's in the same um, way he has friends that he's made with uh, and while at Flint Hill, that when they're home for the holidays, they reconnect, they push one another um, in what they want to pursue outside of college. They're there for one another um, with family celebrations, um, which is amazing when you look at what's going on today that they're so close. And even now with my son um, in the upper school, there have been challenges. And I can say that the administration has been very, very open to contacting us, working with him, making sure he stays on target. Mm -hmm and keeping him focused. And he has been in the Learning Center. He does not have a plan, but the Learning Center has been great in helping us, offering us suggestions on what we can do to continue to engage with him. So I say all that to say, it's a great school. Um, they do a lot to make the students feel welcome and to move forward into that next phase of their lives. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful answer. And I, I really appreciate you incorporating all of your children. <laughs> into that answer. I know all the kids, so I, I, it's nice to hear, hear about them, too. Thank you so much. And uh, Ms. Gillespie and Ms. Bolter, would you like to say something a, a little bit briefly? I think we're a little over time, but if you had a, a few words you'd share, I'd love to hear those if you could. Um, I, I'm good. I'm just going to reiterate that the Learning Center was really the the biggest motivation for us and the fit with Flint Hill and Samara. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Ms. Gillespie, is there anything you'd like to add about what you feel like has made Flint Hill different in, in a good way for your experience? Sure, sure. So I, I think that um, the, the class sizes were definitely a, a huge plus coming from the public school system. Um, my girls, we never looked at, uh, we only looked at one other school. Um, for my son, we did look at um, three or four schools inside the Beltway, both in when he was entering seventh grade and again in ninth grade. And um, we just landed on Flint Hill because we felt like he would be seen at Flint Hill and he would have relationships with teachers through the office hours and through the small class sizes. Um, he's He's got high academic potential and we felt like this would be the best fit mm -hmm. for taking honors classes and and ap classes later on in his high school career and um you know my girls in the learning center they took ap and honors as well so um we just knew it was going to be a really good place for him and uh and we're right he's doing well so sure. i encourage you all to consider flint hill it's just been a great experience for all three of my kids Thank you so much. And, and you know, I'm so sorry if there are other questions that haven't been able to come to the surface, but it is time to hand it back over to the admission office. We're five minutes over. I apologize for going over. But thank you so much, panelists, for your participation. It's just invaluable to hear all of your experiences, current, past, and sometimes multi-child experiences. So thank you for sharing all those. I appreciate it. Okay, uh, Mr. Chang, thank you so much for... Um helping facilitate the panel discussion. And thank you to all students and um, our, our parents for joining us today um, and helping out. Um, at this time, my colleague, uh, Julie Lewis, uh, and I will um, go ahead and talk a little bit about our admission process, uh, next steps, and uh, of course, answer any uh, questions that you might still have. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and just, um, briefly present a uh, standard slideshow that we use. Uh, some of you may already be engaged in the process. Some of you may be considering it. Um, but again, we're happy to, to answer um, questions. 
So um, in terms of, and Miss Lewis, can you tell me if um, you can see this? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and full, full screen it. Um, still visible? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, just, you know, in general, uh, what is required to apply? Um, you know, here's the link in terms of going to our website and uh, starting the application process. It's very direct um, underneath the admission tab. Um, once you, uh, and, uh, you know, put in some general information, we usually will email you back within 24 hours with um, information associated with uh, your account uh, and login information. Um, supporting materials, we ask for uh, transcript uh, information um, from uh, one's current uh, school. Um, and if you're applying for ninth grade, we ask for both seventh and eighth grade uh, grades um, and information. Uh, we ask for both a math and English rec from current uh, teachers. You're also welcome to send in a supplemental recommendation, which a lot of families like to do as well. Um, parent questionnaire and uh, student questionnaire um, you'll fill out. Uh, a writing sample uh, does not have to be graded, just has to show uh, one's writing um, style. Uh, we are an SSAT optional school. We're test optional overall, um, so we do not require uh, any specific test uh, for our application process. We feel strongly about um, the fact that uh, the other in, other information we gather um, in our interview process gives us enough information to make decisions on uh, families and students. So um, that last uh, part down here uh, that you can see, uh, parent um, and uh, student interview, um, it is generally uh, in person. We do have a virtual option um, and we end up interviewing the student and uh, parents uh, separately uh, from one another. Uh, Julie, feel free to jump in at, at any point if you'd like. Yes, um, and so going through the admission process um, for the for future years, meaning 2024-25, the process will start September 1 um, for 24-25. It will start September 1, 2023. So we always start the year prior of students beginning school. So those of you that are looking in the future, you can contact us in September uh, for the next school year admission process. Uh, great, thank you. Um, as far as timeline now, as you can see here, uh, January 20th is our initial um, deadline um, for uh, applying for the upcoming year. Um, however, after January 20th, we go into what we call a rolling admission cycle. So um, both um, Julie, myself, and uh, Lauren South in the upper school continue to work with families um, through the summer um uh, at times uh, obviously where uh, there is room uh, at certain grade levels um mm -hmm. but if you are in process now uh deadline is um you know two days away uh, we will continue to accept materials from um, families that are in process through february 3rd uh, and then you can see our uh, decision day when we send out notifications is march 3rd um, there are certainly many revisit events uh, after uh, March 3rd. Um, and then um, students that uh, are accepted to Flint Hill and uh, make the decision to enroll in Flint Hill will then come uh, in in uh, April and May um, to take uh, assessments. Uh, we require that really that all students take a math assessment language. Uh, and if a student uh, wishes to take any uh, honors level classes as well, uh, for, let's say, contemporary world history or English, they would have to take uh, an assessment for those two subjects. Mm -hmm. Also, if I can add on, those parents um, who are still going through the process, and we are obviously still interviewing um, after January 20th, um, recognizing that the three of us can't obviously you know, meet everyone <laughs> between now and Friday. So if you have not scheduled your interview yet and you are just about finished with your application process or are in process, please um, give us a call and we can schedule it or you can um, contact the officer that you're assigned to, either myself, Julie Lewis, Justin Fitzgerald, or Lauren South. If you contact one of us, we can get you to the right officer to set up your, um, your interview.